Chapter 6 Plight Archibald padded down the stone steps with the bundled baby cradled in his left arm. From outward appearances, one might make the assessment of a very spiritual man. He wore the black cassock every day, even when leading the services upstairs. After all, this man held the office of high priest, and he could do as he desired within this stone fortress. A handful of souls would enter the gate on a daily basis. They came for the two songs, although the songs were whispered by the faithful few. Archibald read the assigned readings, for this was his duty. He used it as a cover for what was taking place in the lower depths of the structure. This wretched, bent soul read the words even as he despised them. He spoke the litany of the songs and prayed the prayers, doing all of this without caring or believing. Archibald eyed those who came in, not because he had any pastoral concern for them or any spiritual care in mind. Rather, he kept track of who entered his domain. Paranoia beholds foes in the regulars as well as in the strangers. This was his fortress, and protecting it meant suspecting the others and guarding himself. The perimeter wall encircled the entire inner structure, thus making the large wooden gate the only access. It was near this gate where he waited and watched a few minutes ago. The woman left a deposit in the foundling box. The wicked man noted the offering and snatched up the baby. He carried it to the altar area and began his descent. Archibald hesitated in doing so, thinking, The foundling box could well serve as an infant's casket, but not with this one. Then he continued with the baby held in one arm, descending from the things which were above to the darkness he nurtured below. Move back into your corner, Picaro. The old man slowly shuffled back as ordered. He had an iron waist restraint chained to him. The other end of the chain was fastened into the corner wall where he stood. Archibald said, You decrepit excuse for a human being. You now have a congregation once again, for there are now two here. The old man retorted, Simply having two does not make a congregation. That promise is fulfilled when the two are gathered in his name. Whatever. It is not whatever. It is what it is. Archibald placed the baby on Picaro's blanketed pallet and said, You're in charge of this subject. I will be back for the measurements needed to construct his apparatus. Picaro spat at Archibald and said with vehemence and in a determined cadence, You are pure evil. Archibald paused in thought and replied, Hmm, true. Picaro continued, and that's not a subject. That's a baby. Call him what you want. He's your parishioner. You will take care of him. If he dies, you die. Let it be so. That's a relief and not a threat. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. The evil man said, But is it better for this subject for you to remain as you are? Picaro answered, this baby will be crucified tonight. Archibald ignored the old man and continued, The gray woman will bring what is needed for you to care for the subject. She'll empty the waste bucket twice a day instead of once. The food types and amounts will remain the same. The aged captive declared, The baby will need bedding and clothing. Have the gray woman bring some. Archibald asked rhetorically, do you give orders to me? Your insolent order is going to cost you, old man. It seems you have a blanket for your bedding and you have clothing on your back. You can make do for the subject with what you have. You decide who goes without. Having made this declaration, the evil Archibald turned and ascended. Picaro stared into the darkness of the stairway and began to speak to himself, which was his habit. After so much time alone, and as often happens naturally to the elderly. Some might consider him crazy or insane, but that was far from the situation. What wickedness ascends to the holy place? 
That man hasn't got a shred of conscience or compassion in his callous soul. Is that a fair judgment? Or am I not putting the best construction on my neighbor? He's not my neighbor. And yet he is. If one's torturer and jailer can be a neighbor. The baby stirred and Picaro's attention became directed to the infant. Picaro moved from the corner, his chain rattling on the uneven stone floor. Well, little one, here we are. I'm Picaro, but you can just call me Pick. Do you have a name? Let's get you unwrapped for a minute to see what you are wearing. Maybe your name is written somewhere inside. Nice blanket. Very nice little outfit you're wearing. Someone cared about you. Someone's missing you right now. What anguished tears your parents must be shedding at this dark moment. May God be with them. No name inside here. Ten toes. Ten fingers. Looking good. Need changing? No. Ah, hello, young man. Baby boy. So, let's make sure you're okay. I'm going to turn you over and check your back and the back of your head. Everything seems to be... Picaro jerked into a frozen position. He instantly knew what the situation was when he saw the letters inked on the baby's back. Doppelganger! Oh, little one, a people's superstition results in this. A man's wickedness compounds it. But you don't know about any of this, do you? What a sorry state you're in. You have been disowned by society. Other than several inside these walls, perhaps only one person knows that you exist. Your mother. How she must be weeping at this moment. God, please be with her. And I can't promise you anything here except a life of pain and a struggle to take each breath. You're looking at me with those innocent eyes. You watch me, and you have the look of trust. You seem to be expecting it of me. I'll do what I can to help you for as long as I can. So let's begin. As I said, I am Pick, and you are, well, you are unnamed. Ah, let's see. I guess it's up to me to name you. What shall it be? Picaro quickly wrapped the boy and picked him up as he heard footsteps on the stairs. The gray woman entered the candlelit room, a bundle under one arm, an empty pail held in the same hand, and a jar of water in the opposite. The expression on her face was one of an emotionless demeanor. Picaro wondered if this was caused by either being seemingly indifferent, or being bored with indignation, or from an infected soul due to the evil one above. She put the items on the small side table, and set the pail on the floor. Without a word or change in her face, she took the other pail. The gray woman turned to leave. The old man said to her, Thank you. You're most kind. Anything extra that you bring down to us would be greatly appreciated. The gray woman said nothing, and although she hesitated in her assent, she neither turned back nor replied. After a moment, she resumed her departure. I mean... There are some food items a baby needs that I don't get in my daily rations. Also, an extra candle would benefit the baby, and some extra rags. Actually, forget the candle. The rags are much more necessary. And the food, the baby food. There was no response from the gray woman as her footfalls dampened into silence. Well, now, little one, we have what we need for this night. Everything but your name. I've no idea what your mother named you, if indeed she did. It's not written on your back, but I'm sure she loved you. And listen, little one, I will care for you and do what I can for you, but I truly fear for what is ahead for you, little one. Oh, this won't do. I can't keep calling you little one. That's a good name, but not for long. You'll grow. At least I think you will. It's hard to tell how big you're going to get. It's hard to tell how warped you're going to be, but I digress. Your name. Okay, so I'm going to have to give you a name. If you don't like it, you can change it some day, if some day comes. As for now, you must die, but don't let that scare you. There's no pain or hurt in the death you die tonight. Oh, 
I have the perfect name for you. Wait until you hear it. Just a moment. The baby boy looked at Picaro as if he understood every word being said. He didn't, but he watched the old man with eyes that revealed no fear. There were, if possible, the eyes of trust. While still holding the baby, Picaro placed his empty food bowl on the table and poured water into it from the jar. He spoke the words of invocation, recited the creed, and prayed the prayer. He recited some words from memory about little children being brought to the Lord God. Then he poured water on the head of the baby and said, Plight, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Plight, you are now a child of God and an heir of heaven. You have been crucified with Christ. Now your life is hidden with God through his Son. You are Jesus' little lamb. You are plight. Welcome into the family of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Can you say, Amen? Amen. This is most certainly true. Well done, plight. As he said this, Picaro made the sign of the cross. Chapter 7 the Council The doctor called the council together and asked for updates and progress. The general presented a situation report about troop deployment, tactical plans, logistics and resupply plans, enemy strength, patrolling, sorties to develop fluid actions, enlistment figures, and priority targets. We're not ready, but we will be at the dawn of the day. The politician gave a status report on strategic placement of personnel infiltration of education centers, effective predictions of neighborhood organizers, and program implementers. The politician continued, We'll not really be sure when we're ready. The general deals with military science. I deal with societal art. Science lends itself to numbers and understanding. Art puts us in the arenas of intuition and instinct. The doctor spoke sternly, You don't need to educate us. Your words border on an apology. Apologies are for the weak. The politician retorted, Are you educating us? The recruiter broke the tense atmosphere. We have trouble recruiting quality spies and assassins. The ones we now have are mediocre. Drugs and alcohol are often their priority. Keeping the killers contained is a challenge. They're as ready as they're going to be for the dawn of the day. We have a few good spies, and they continue to provide excellent information through dead drops and their preferred tradecraft exercises. A drug-free, alcohol-free, ideological assassin, not motivated by money, would be an excellent asset. We must make do with what we have until the day, and yes, I am educating you. Deal with it. The council adjourned, and the four men receded into the dark corners of the night. Chapter 8. Zechariah Going to the oasis so soon? asked the watchman from his position at the balcony on the second story of the tower. The young widow answered smartly, Watchman, I'm not early. I always leave an hour before dawn. The watchman laughed in admiration and continued, You know what I mean. It's only been six days since you gave birth to Zechariah. Now you are already back to your daily trip to the oasis. Ignoring his line of questioning, she spoke, Watchman, tell me of the night. The watchman's tone changed, now speaking quite formally. The night was quiet. Since the last of the men returned from the river with clay shortly after sunset, no one has passed by my view. The way appears clear for you, but please remember that appearances do not always speak of safety. Reports have been received of a Manichaean harassing those taking water from the oasis to the riverbed. There are no physical enemies nearby, but what you will encounter in the distance, either physical or spiritual, remains unknown to me. I have not seen any sand men among the desert wanderers for many days, but they may be nearby, as there are some in the city. Be cautious and prepared. As you know, the king has promised to return. Be ready if you meet him on the way. Will you bring water for Zechariah's washing? Yes, Watchman Pintock, 
today, along with what I carry for our personal needs for the public donation and a small drink offering for a few plants in your garden. I'll bring some for Zechariah's washing. Will you carry both Zechariah and the water you need? Not unless I stop this idle talk, watchman, the young woman replied quickly and sharply. You have nothing to prove, declared the watchman, combining a mild chiding with growing respect. You know, you just might need some help from someone. Evidently I do not, she said with measured bite. The remark pierced the pre-dawn darkness as well as the watchman's soul. He could only wince, groan, and add in a repentant voice, I'm sorry. In the name of the king, please forgive me. The young widow said nothing, opting to wave an absolution as she passed the tower and ventured into the pre-dawn light of the cold southwestern desert. Zechariah's mother was one of those women forced by the circumstances of life to live beyond her young years. Orphaned at ten, she was taken in and raised by her grandmother. While still in her teens, she married and soon became widowed. Zechariah was born shortly after her twentieth birthday. Sudden, tragic, senseless, easily prevented, horrible, cold, life-changing events end both childhood and marriage. The people who are left must go on, and usually do so by polarizing to one of two opposite directions, either defiant rejection or lip-pursing acceptance. The former is a covenant with death that, in its manifestations, ranges from immobile depression to vindictive acts of anarchy. Of the two poles, consuming rejection is the easier path because it is natural and wide the one chosen and walked by the majority. The other direction is a testament of life, one confessed in a dying world, one in which the king is acknowledged as permitting such tragedies when he had the power to prevent a child from being an orphan and a wife from being a widow. This narrow way is the more difficult and demanding because it involves not only a struggle with oneself, but also a certain wrestling with the king. He promises that everything happening in the world, while not necessarily his will and desire, will ultimately work out to the benefit and good of the king's people. Experienced in the difficult way and guided by a strength exceeding her own, Zechariah's mother continued her confession of the king. Throughout the day she spoke to her unborn child, telling the little one of the king's stories. At night she softly sang hymns to the baby nestled beside her liver and lungs, teaching him not only the truths of the kingdom, but also the self-quieting skills that would be of help many times in life. In the double darkness of night and womb, Zechariah felt the vibrations of his mother's quiet weeping and the small sudden movements caused by her grieving sobs. He listened in wonder, and, because the life is in the blood, he experienced her emotions. After his birth, the young widow brought Zechariah to congregate with the others in the cool shadow of the tower at Evensong, at first holding her infant son, later standing beside the toddler. She taught her boy about the king's sacrificial love for all people and his royal arrival that might well happen at any moment. She encouraged Zechariah to listen carefully to the king's edicts announcements, and proclamations, and if he had any questions, the boy could ask her or the watchman. Even though one or two scowled and grumbled guttural noises of indignant disapproval, most people smiled when, one day, at the appearance of the watchman on the second-story balcony, the little boy prematurely asked the versicle in a still, small voice, "'Watchman, tell us of the night!' With a smile of admiration, the watchman soberly delivered the appropriate liturgical response. In the ninth year of the boy's life, Zechariah questioned his mother as they journeyed to the oasis after morn song. Mother, is the king more powerful than the watchman? She laughed within herself and replied, Yes, Zachy, he is. The king is more powerful than anyone or anything. Several minutes of silence preceded his next question. Mother, does the king love you? 
Yes, Zechariah, he loves us both, more than we can know. In a slightly different tone, he asked, Does the king not love you? Child, she said, adjusting her water jug in order to look into his eyes, you're asking a strange question, but you're thinking hard about something. You must ask the same question with different words. Okay, mother, he replied, and continued a moment later, Does the king not hit and then hit? She wrinkled her brow and said, Zeki, I don't understand your question. You are thinking about something, but you should not tell me about that something until you are able to ask me a clearer question. Ask the same question again, but use different words. With a hint of frustration, he responded quickly, Does the king love us, and then do bad things to us because we did bad things to him? Okay, Zeki, I believe I am beginning to understand your question. The king always loves us. The king is good and does not do bad things to us. Sometimes you do bad things. Sometimes I do bad things. The king does not do bad things to us because we do bad things. However, sometimes the bad things we do have consequences. Remember the time you were playing around the water jug even though you knew the rule? Yes. Well, you did a bad thing by breaking the rule. Then because you broke the rule, the water jug was broken, and all the water spilled. Was it the king's fault? No. Was it my fault? No. Were you able to get a drink of water that day? No. I got very thirsty. Yes. And being thirsty was one of the consequences that you had because you broke the rule. Now, Zeki, who else suffered that same consequence? The boy thought for a moment and then looked at his mother. You did. That's right. I suffered the consequences because someone else broke the rule. After you broke the jug, do you remember how you felt inside? I felt real bad. I know what I had done and it scared me. I wanted to run away and hide. Yes, son, you had a guilty conscience. That's another one of those consequences. But you forgave me, I remember. Yes, because I love you. I told you the rule because I love you. I didn't want you to suffer any of the consequences. I confronted you because I love you. I forgave you for the same reason. I love you. As you live with the consequences, I'll help you because I love you. Do you understand? Yes. Does the king love in the same way? Yes. But I'm not able to love perfectly. He loves you and me perfectly. Now tell me the something you're thinking about. Mother, what bad thing did I do that made the king kill your husband? Zechariah! She exclaimed his name with increasing control and continued, The king did not kill my beloved John. There was an accident at the dune. Sometimes accidents just happen, and it's no one's fault, not yours or mine or anyone else's. But I must have done a bad thing that made the king angry so that he didn't protect my father and made you live with the consequences. Oh, Zechariah, how do such thoughts form in your head? You weren't even born when your father died. You did nothing wrong. You couldn't. Let me see. Maybe we could work together and get an answer to your question. Let's begin by you explaining why there are Yankers and Yankees working at the edge of the dune. Do you remember? Yes, he answered. Sometimes there's a sandslide, and the Yankers watch for those times. The digging Yankees are in constant danger, and they trust that the Yankers are looking out for a sand slide and will jerk them away if a slide begins. Okay, fine. Now tell me about the ropes used. The ropes? Well, they are strong ropes and are tied around the waist of the Yankees. That's right, she said. If a slide ever begins to happen, the Yankers will jerk very hard on the ropes with all their strength. Sometimes the Yankees suffer terrible rope burns Scrapes, bruises, and cuts have resulted from the Yankees being drug across the ground. You've seen the mangled arm of Andres Yankeeson 
as well as the scars on the stomachs, chests, back, arms, and legs of some of the Yankees. The sudden jerking force has broken ribs on some of the other diggers. There is truth to the saying, a jerk at both ends of the rope is an awfully good pain. Son, why are these violent jerks and pains inflicted by the jerkers? Mother, he answered, they are bad things done, so worse things don't happen. Yes, very good, Zechariah. Now, how have you got this figured out about the death of my husband and your father? That's hard. For me, the death of my father is a bad thing, and I can't figure out what would be worse that the king was trying to prevent. Mother, was the death of your husband a bad thing for you? She swallowed firmly and replied carefully, Zeki, I don't think of John's death in terms of a good thing. I don't permit myself to think about it as a bad thing the king did. I just wouldn't have chosen it. But the king did, and I simply trust he is at the other end of the rope. Zechariah continued to pursue. Was the death of my father a bad thing for me? Her emotions clogged her mind momentarily. After choking back a sob, she blurted a frightful pent-up, Zechariah. Following a solitary sigh, she confessed from her heart, Yes. She held her son closely and wept openly. Later, they continued their walk in the direction of the oasis, neither speaking for extended minutes. The woman sensed another question and said, Have you formed your thoughts yet? He asked, Mother, is the king more powerful than the dune? Recognizing the struggle taking place in her son's mind, she answered him, Yes. An hour later, as they sat in the bushy shade at the edge of the water and filled their water jugs, she said to her son, You remember I told you that you could ask me any question you had? I remember. Please remember this also. While you may ask any question, there is no certainty that I am able to answer it. Zeki, do you understand? I do. Perhaps I shall save some of my questions and ask the king one day. I think you should. In the meantime, dear son, please do not trouble yourself too much with these matters. Chapter 9 Cabin Huddled in a dark niche in the hardened hut was Cabin Yankerson, son of Darren Yankerson and Karine, Digger's daughter. Cabin lived under a single board shelf and behind a raveled khaki curtain. The young teenager was entering puberty. Throughout his years he had experienced the will of his father and learned by conditioning to remain out of sight and hiding quietly in the darkness. As a child, he was mistreated so badly from infancy by a parent and ignored by the same for the same period of time that he didn't know any other way of life. He had no conscience. He hated his mother for being so weak and his father for being such a beast who beat and brutalized both him and her. At night, Cabin would have remained hidden in his spot and never come out had not hunger overcome his servile fear of another beating. The warped teenager watched his intoxicated father eating, noting the places where bits of bread and pieces of food fell. Usually, Darren fell asleep before his meal was finished. Cabin watched and waited, listening especially for the deep snores. When he heard them, he quietly ventured forth and snatched the nearest crumbs on the floor. With the appearance of a statue, he listened again. His head raised to the level of the table, and his eyes beheld the unfinished meal. Most of the time, Cavan was able to take the food and retreat into his world. Occasionally, the beastly man was waiting for him, and backhanded the boy across the face with full force, sending Cavan reeling, tumbling, and taking cover behind the curtain. There he recovered from his whirling head, stinging face, temporarily dislocated jaw, ringing ear, and bleeding eyebrow. Darren bellowed a laugh and spewed out the slurred words, Boy, 
If you're going to eat in my world, you're going to have to be bigger and better than me. Kevin said nothing aloud. He muttered a few words silently to himself. As he sat in the darkness rubbing his wounds and repressing his hunger, he rocked slowly. Kevin looked the look that promised and threatened. I will. I will. Tonight I will. And he did. For hours he waited behind the khaki curtain and fumed as he restrained himself. The drunken Darren cursed his wife and threatened to beat her. Neighbors yelled at him. There were shouts ordering him to leave his wife and son alone. One man said he was going to come over and show him how a proper beating was given. Darren invited him to come over and try. He promised to beat him just like he had done to his wife many times. The neighbor told him to leave his wife alone and fight a man instead. Darren told him to come over and try him. He did. They fought outside and both received blows and were bleeding. Cavan continued his slow rocking as he waited. A law enforcement officer on foot patrol told them to stop fighting and go home. If they didn't, he'd have them jailed. They left. Gradually everyone settled for the night. Darren lowered his head to his arms while still at the table. Kareen slept in the bed in the one-room hut. Cavan rocked. I will. I will. Tonight, I will. A couple hours later, Cavan quietly emerged from his curtain cave. Darren was now passed out from his drinking and was sleeping with his head on the table. He had puffy wounds on his face and open cut above an eyebrow and scuffed knuckles. Cavan grabbed a wooden club that had been made from a broken sand shovel. With a forceful swing, he caused Darren to go from a state of sleep to one of unconsciousness. With a newfound strength, Cavan used a large piece of wax cloth to smother his father. He leaned down and whispered into the dead man's ear, I may not be bigger than you, but I am badder. He then went over and used a pillow to murder his mother. She was more difficult because she struggled. However, the boy, who was becoming a man, unleashed a demonic strength that suppressed her attempts to save herself. Cavan left the pillow on her face. He threw the club and cloth into the fire. Cavan then retreated into his cave and waited for morning. The sun rose on a new day. The city was calm. People were waking up and starting to move about. Suddenly there was the sound of a child's scream. It was a girl's scream, or the scream of a young boy. People looked out of windows and came out their doors. Their attention was directed to the little neighborhood boy they knew as Cavan. The questions came quickly. What is it? What happened? Why are you screaming? Is he hurt? In the voice of a child, Cavan said, It's my mom and dad. I can't wake them. Help me, please. Won't you help me? I want my mom and my dad. An investigation into the deaths of Darren Yankerson and Kareen Digger's daughter was conducted. Based on the many witness accounts and the history of marital discord, it was determined that Darren had murdered his wife and then had succumbed to a ruptured blood vessel in his brain caused by the fight. The man who fought with Darren was charged with manslaughter, but that charge was dismissed when it was pointed out that the fatal brain injury could have been caused by the exertion and struggle in smothering his wife. Throughout the days following the two deaths and the weeks of investigation, Cavan played the part of a child. He remained in the streets and made sure that he didn't cause any problems. His neighbors made sure that he had plenty of food. Chapter 10 Elizabeth Several clay huts away from the death-filled hut of Cavan lived two orphans who had unofficially adopted one another. They cared for each other, giving and receiving unconditional love. At both Mornsong and Evensong they walked hand in hand to the tower. Their harmonizing voices hymned confessions of the king and reflected the lives they enjoyed together. The gray-haired old woman was named Rosemary Garden's daughter. 
though her friends affectionately called her Old Rose. She had the best vegetable garden in the city, and grew more crops on a square foot basis than anyone else. Old Rose was often asked her opinions on soil conditions, watering times, and pest control. More often than not, she replied with an old saying, sometimes addressing the gardening issue, and other times seemingly not. Watering before going to mourn song doubles the harvest. Most people thought Old Rose not to be completely in control of her mental faculties, because she talked and muttered when no one was with her. Actually, such utterances were neither unintentional nor undirected. Sometimes she spoke to the king. At other times, she recited certain steps in various horticultural processes, speaking to herself so she didn't lose her place and forget an important step as a result. Contrary to outward appearances, Old Rose listened and watched. She had seen the lumps on Karine's face and listened to the hurt in her heart. Old Rose heard the smallest points in the watchman's proclamations, appropriating the truths for her own well-being, and making certain that her adopted hutmate understood the applications of severity and kindness. The other orphan in the hut, where old Rose lived, was a twelve-year-old girl whose name was Elizabeth. When she was but nine, she came to old Rose's clay hut with nothing but a dirty blanket. She lost her parents during an outing and had wandered in the wilderness for days. She asked to stay with old Rose and was welcomed. Elizabeth brought joy to the solitary life of the lonely gardener. Within hours, if anyone had been near enough to hear, old Rose's mutterings included repeated volleys to the king, words of awe, songs of thanksgiving, and petitions pleading to be able to keep the girl. Elizabeth found solace and comfort with old Rose. The two orphans were inseparable. Each day, hand in hand, they made the two trips to the tower. Elizabeth and Old Rose traded vegetables for supplies, especially water. Together they worked in their garden, the elder teaching the younger about every aspect of productive gardening, the younger showing the older how to look at things with wonder and excitement. Old Rose's eyes twinkled in awe, her lower jaw dropped, and her mouth ceased its mumbling when Elizabeth asked a question one day, "'May I call you Rosemary?' The old woman had not been called that name in more than three decades. It would have sounded foreign, and she would have been offended had anyone else spoken that name and made that request. But this child was different, and the way she said the old woman's name and the manner in which she asked the question were like the casting of an enchantment. The name Rosemary sounded clear and clean as it tripped effortlessly off the lips of Elizabeth. Old Rose could only nod permission. Elizabeth added in a whisper, I'll only use Rosemary when we're alone, like this, okay? If anyone else is around, I'll use Old Rose just as the others do. That way, it'll be special between you and me, okay, Rosemary? Again, the old woman nodded her approval, being further amazed and prompting her to confess to herself Indeed, child, it is special between us. And you can call me Ellie when others are around, and Elizabeth when we're like this, okay? That sounds just fine, Elizabeth. In the dusk after evensong, the two orphans walked back to their hut holding hands. Depending on the mood, they talked, sang, discussed the proclamation, listened, recited a reading, or watched. After arriving home, they put out the fresh vegetables, a melon or two, a loaf of bread, and a few pieces of fruit for the shadow child. Shortly thereafter, they went to bed and fell asleep quickly, old Rose's hand resting on the back of Elizabeth. In the morning, the food was always gone.